Welcome to the New Testament Review, where every episode we discuss a classic piece of New Testament scholarship. I'm Ian Mills. And I'm Laura Robinson. And we are PhD students in New Testament studies at Duke University. Today we're going to be discussing William Vreda's Messianic Secret, published in 1901. Big picture first. There's a motif of secrecy that is especially pronounced in the Gospel of Mark. Vreda is going to give a literary, theological explanation for this, as opposed to a historical explanation. Actually, he's going to argue that the motif of secrecy must be explained in terms of the development of Christian theology and the author's literary agenda, rather than the activities of the historical Jesus. We're going to discuss Vreda's explanations first, but his real accomplishment is changing the question from why did it happen this way to Why did Mark write it this way? Ian, how about you tell us a little bit about the context behind this book? Right. Uh, So Vreda opens up with sort of a status questionis of historical Jesus and gospel interpretation. At the time, Markan chronology basically was the backbone of reconstructions of the historical Jesus. Previous lives of Jesus assumed the fundamental historicity of the outline of Jesus' ministry according to the Gospel of Mark. This theme of secrecy, repeatedly telling people uh, not to tell others who he was, Jesus in Mark 4 talking about teaching and riddles, this theme of secrecy was interpreted as Jesus correcting the disciples' interpretation of his messiahship. So the disciples were expecting, according to contemporary interpreters with Vreda, were expecting some sort of conquering messiah, and Jesus seeks to correct this with his own conception of a suffering messiah. And he does this over the course of the gospel, the turning point being Caesarea Philippi at Mark 8, 9, uh, where it says he expounded to the disciples that he was going to suffer and die. Right away, Vreda points out that in Mark 2.20, early on, long before Caesarea Philippi, in the discussion of fasting, Jesus already is discussing there is going to be a day when the bridegroom is taken away. He's already discussing at the beginning of the narrative that he is going to suffer. So this is a problem for that contemporary interpretation. Furthermore, he points out that this, this theme, this progression of messianic understanding just isn't present in the Gospels. Rather, Jesus is telling people to be silent because they have correctly identified him. God is hardening their hearts and preventing them from understanding. Mark 4, Jesus says he tells parables so that they would not understand. It's not a matter of trying to clarify something, but of trying to suppress something which Jesus, according to the Gospel of Mark, believes to be true. So this explanation doesn't work, and Vreda's work is going to be a corrective to both of these elements, the Markan, the historicity of Markan chronology, and this interpretation of secrecy. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to the issue of what exactly exactly is the messianic secret in Mark and where do we see this uh, where do we see this motif show up so one really good example of it actually how about Ian why don't you just read to us uh, one of the key passages sure. for illustrating this so the first category of these are the silencing of demons crowds healed people and disciples who have perceived who Jesus is or Jesus has done something for them and in Mark 3 we see Jesus silencing unclean spirits who announce you are the son of God and Mark says but he sternly ordered them not to make him known. Yeah. And this happens a lot of times. You know, it's the, the demons are uh, suspect number one for this issue because they often say out loud that Jesus is the Messiah because they have the supernatural uh, ability to know who he is. But it also extends beyond this. In in cases of healing, Mark 1 has a couple of instances, I think, actually, mm-hmm. of a person being healed who is afterwards told not to tell anybody or the onlookers are told not to tell anyone. There's a really good example of this is in Mark 1, the healing of the leper who approaches Jesus Jesus and asks to be made well, and uh, Jesus tells him afterwards not to tell anyone. Yeah, this it, it appears a lot. If you just start reading Mark, it'll just start coming up all over the place, to be honest. Right, and Mark 9.9, 9, where Jesus tells the disciples not to tell anyone about this revelation about Jesus until after his resurrection is another central one for Vreda. Uh, another place where this shows up is uh, the parable passage in Mark 4, uh, what we call like, the parable theory of Mark. You know, what, what we would commonly think is that parables are intended to illustrate something or to uh, make something clear, and we'll talk more about this in the historicity section. But in Mark, they're actually not, that's not what parables are for. Uh, What Mark actually says is that Jesus told parables to the crowd in order to conceal the teachings of the kingdom from them, and then he taught not in parables more plainly to the disciples when they were in private. Uh, In Mark 4, 10 to 12, Jesus has been teaching in parables, and then uh, his disciples basically pull him aside and ask what this is all about. So in Mark 4, 10, uh, when he was alone, those who were around him, along with the 
12 asked him about the parables, and he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those who are outside, everything comes in parables, in order that they may indeed look, but not perceive, and may indeed listen, but not understand, so that they may not turn again and be forgiven. So, Jesus teaches in parables, lest they turn and believe, in order to prevent them from understanding. Also grouped in the Messianic secret by Vreda is the disciples' consistent failure to understand. So, for instance, in 651, there's this use of the divine passive. The disciples' hearts were hardened. They're prevented from understanding. Yeah, so a huge part of Vreda's argument is that this can't be a historical memory of how the historical Jesus actually went around teaching and preaching and healing, uh, because it just doesn't make any sense. (laughs) So, yeah. If you start actually really reading the narrative, you see that the way in which Jesus is commanding people to be silent and the way it takes effect is just it's irrational and the effects can't be, the desired effects can't actually be taking place. But don't take our word for it. <laughs> but a, a really great example of this is Mark 5, where the synagogue leader has a little girl who dies uh, while Jesus is on his way to go heal her. And by the time Jesus gets there, there's already a big crowd outside uh, mourning her. And then Jesus goes in into the house, he only brings his closest disciples and uh, the girl's parents. He raises her from the dead and then says that nobody can say what just happened. Well, that doesn't make any sense. The cr- everyone already knows this girl's dead. You know, there's no way in which this would actually be effective. What happens next week when this little girl shows up at synagogue <laughs> and everyone remembers she died last week? That doesn't make any sense. Another example in Mark 7 of the literary constructed of the secrecy motif is the healing of the deaf mute. So Jesus begins the healing by taking the deaf mute away from the crowd privately. He then heals him by spitting and touching his tongue and then concludes by telling the crowd who are no longer present not to tell anyone. So Mark is the author is giving this literary overlay putting the secrecy motif on a narrative which already has Jesus removing the deaf mute from the crowd. So, additional examples of this sort of narrative constructedness of the secrecy motif would include blind Bartimaeus in Mark 10. So, Breda is trying to show that this isn't something that is just explicable by saying, well, it's something that Jesus did, because the narrative of Mark itself does this. So, in Mark 10, blind Bartimaeus starts proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah, and the crowd comes and silences blind Bartimaeus. So, it's not something Jesus is doing. Here, the crowd telling Bartimaeus to be silent. Uh, Similarly, Mark has the hardening of the hearts, probably a divine passive, as mentioned, in 651 of the disciples. So, the disciples are prevented from understanding what Jesus is teaching. So, narrative forces are conspiring throughout the gospel to maintain this secrecy. Another piece of evidence for the age historicity of the messianic secret is the fact that Mark's parable theory actually doesn't line up historically with what we know about how parables were used in the ancient right. world. Uh, as we said, so in Mark 4, the, the purpose of parables is to conceal things from the crowd so that they don't actually receive the teachings of the kingdom. But when you look at rabbinic parallels, uh, it becomes really clear that parables actually aren't intended to keep secrets, but they're um, but they're intended to illuminate things. The rabbinic parable, which is called a mishal, is actually compared in the Talmud to uh, a, li- a little candle or something, or a handle on a pot, like something that lets you carry something around or illuminate. It's not something that makes the pot heavier or more unwieldy. This is this is a practicality thing. And this is also borne out in the parables that are actually in Mark. Like, they're not completely obscure. This isn't, you know, these aren't the sayings of Thomas in the right. in the, in the the Coptic Gospels. This is something that the reader is clearly supposed to be able to intuit in meetings, if they, even if they are open for interpretation. They're not confusing. As a rule, they're not cryptic utterances meant to conceal the truth. Another one of Vreda's arguments is that several of the secrecy stories hinge on a implausible supernatural event. So, for instance, the very first one where the demoniac shows up in the synagogue requires the historian to think that a demon-possessed person would actually have special insight into Jesus's character. And this, Vreda points out, is really problematic. This requires the historian to actually suppose that there was a demon who really understood or had special knowledge and says this is the sort of thing we can't do anymore, argues Freda. Similarly, a lot of the examples of healed people hinge on there 
being an actual miracle to report. This one's a bit more a bit more problematic. It depends because, a lot on your hermeneutic of miracles. Yes, yeah. Um, yeah. because even if you don't think miracles are actually admissible as historical explanations, clearly there were miracle workers who went out and like who had a following and people telling them there still are today. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't have to believe in miracles to believe in miracle workers. This we've saved this one for last because it's troubled. Yeah. Laura, what is Vreda's explanation for all this? Why did Mark introduce this secretive overlay? What's his thesis? All right. So the thesis of Vreda's work, Messianic Secret, is that the earliest Christians believed that Jesus lived his life not as the Messiah, but became it at the resurrection. Mm -hmm. That the vindication of Jesus after his death, that when he was raised up, that's when he became the Messiah. So yeah, so a really good example of this would be beginning of Romans 1, when Paul describes Jesus as uh, being descended from the son of David and declare the Messiah at the resurrection. Like that's an uh, evidence of this. This sort of like post-resurrection uh, messianic identity. The same thing also shows up in Acts 2. Peter says that Jesus was made the Messiah after the resurrection by God. If earliest Christianity believed that Jesus was not the Messiah in his life, but he became the Messiah at the resurrection, obviously this is not something that is affirmed in the Gospels. So Vreda's argument is that Mark takes this idea of Jesus becoming the Messiah after the resurrection and retrojects it into Jesus's entire life, that Jesus always thought he was the Messiah and always believed he was and always taught he was. The historical Jesus Vreda would argue, didn't teach he was the Messiah. So how is it that that Jesus did not claim to be the Messiah, but after his death, he was proclaimed to be such? How do we reconcile these two things? And the way that Vreda says that Mark got around this is the idea of the messianic secret, that uh, Jesus, his whole life, believed and taught that he was the Messiah, but he kept this really tightly under wraps, and it didn't get out at Jesus's own command until after the resurrection. Right. So Mark 9.9 is a key passage for Vreda's scheme in which Jesus commands the disciples to keep his teaching a secret until after the resurrection. It's worth noting that Vreda's diagnosis of the problem and sort of methodological innovations have been more influential on New Testament studies than his particular solution. So don't shut it off if you find his analysis of the historical Jesus intuitively implausible. We'll get there. This book book still matters. (gasps) All right. So basically, the payoff of all of this is that if the messianic secret is not historical, if the if the historical Jesus really didn't go around trying to keep a really tight lid on what he was doing, then it follows that this is a theological and literary creation. So the question is, what does this do? And for Vreda, they were trying to deal with the problem that the historical Jesus didn't go around saying he was the Messiah. Uh, he didn't think he was the savior of Israel, but the first Christians all did think that. So how do you reconcile the fact that, you know, after Jesus... Jesus is dead, everyone thinks he's the Messiah, but before they didn't. Or the reason why early Christians would have said is the messianic secret, that during Jesus's life, uh, Jesus kept it really quiet, who he really was, and then after the resurrection, the disciples were free to proclaim him uh, as he really was, as the king of Israel and as the, as the Messiah. So there are some serious problems with Vreda's system, and the most obvious one is that Jesus's commands to silence and to secrecy never work. Most of the times when Jesus says, go and tell no one, the next verse says, the person went deaf and told the entire village. Typically, the messianic secret was a failure, according to Mark. People went and spread it all the more widely, over and over and over again. So, if this is a literary invention meant to explain why no one during his lifetime thought Jesus was the Messiah, you wouldn't have expected that to be there. You wouldn't have expected the payoff of secrecy to be everybody found out that he was the Messiah. So this is a really serious problem, not with Vreda's recognition of the literary constructedness and the ahistoricity of the secret, but with Vreda's explanation for why Mark is doing this. And then we get into issues that, if you've listened to our other shows, the question of the historical Jesus and whether or not he thought of himself as the Messiah or this apocalyptic figure. Uh, One big problem with the argument that Jesus didn't think he was the Messiah, but after the resurrection experiences and appearances, everybody thought he was, is that it raises the question of what about thinking Jesus had been raised from the dead would make people think he was there for the Messiah. Um, when you look at ancient Jewish references to the Messiah and what they thought that he would do, I mean, of course, messianism in the ancient world is a very muddy category, and it's, there's a lot of competing definitions. But one thing that doesn't show up is the idea that he will die and rise from the dead. Right. So if Jesus didn't say he was the Messiah, why would thinking he had been raised from the dead make people think that he was? Right. Dale Allison brings out this in a big way, that the most plausible explanation for this is that people were already teaching that he was the Messiah. 
Messiah, because resurrection is not part of the lexicon of messiahship. Another one is the problem of the titulus. So Nils Dahl makes this argument most famously that the title King of the Jews on the titulus of Jesus, on the placard where Jesus is crucified, is not the sort of thing that the church would have invented. King of the Jews is not a title that the church gave to Jesus. It's not a theme of the Gospel of Mark. This looks like the sort of thing that the church might have even been embarrassed about. Mark already knows the, you know, the story of the Syrophoenician woman, etc., already knows about the uh, mission to the Gentiles. King is not something that is often applied to Jesus. So this looks like the sort of thing that has some grounding in historical reality. And so probably isn't invented. And so probably Jesus is arrested and killed for some sort of messianic uh, reputation or or claims or... Yeah, but there's there's good evidence beside this that Jesus thought of himself as the Messiah during his lifetime. And this isn't something early Christians made up. A really good instance of this, the fact that Jesus had 12 disciples. Uh, This is attested in both Paul and John and Mark. Uh, It appears a lot of different places. How do you get from 12 disciples to Messiah? Well, you know, of course, there's 12 tribes of Israel, and the reconstitution of the 12 is really strongly associated with Israel's eschatological and uh, mess- in messianic hopes. So by virtue of having 12 people following him around and sticking to this 12 number for the disciples, this does seem to indicate that Jesus thought of himself as the one who was going to restore Israel. Joel Marcus also draws attention to the triumphal entry as being this sort of public action of Jesus that looks like some sort of messianic claim. Historical issues around the triumphal entry are a bit more problematic. Go listen to our episode on Dale Allison's Jesus as Eschatological Prophet, and hopefully we'll do some more, one of Smorin Schweitzer and other authors who've argued this, but you get the gist. There probably are good reasons to think that the traditions received were not without messianic we're, we're not so non-messianic. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, it probably sounds to some of you listening at home that we've just brought up this book and then explained everything that's wrong with it, uh, and that therefore you can turn this off and forget everything you've you've heard. And we're not advocating for that. Right. is actually really important for modern New Testament scholarship. You know, maybe his the way he worked out the messianic secret in uh, Christian history, maybe it didn't hold water, but this book has had a lot of staying power. Uh, in a lot of ways, Vreda is the father of redaction and narrative criticism, paying attention to the fact that the Gospels have literary theological motifs that structure their content, that the Gospel authors are rewriting, reworking these narratives. The the fact that Mark groups all of the aphoristic sayings as if Jesus said all of them in one day, and the next day does all of his healings in one big group. This is not a, this is not recorded chronologically, but thematic groupings of similar stories in large clusters is something we can really attribute to Vreda, because prior to that, you know, this was treated as more or less historical. People didn't look at the structure of the Gospels as a thing that had to be invented and created for theological and literary purposes by their authors, and this is something that has become a really huge part of New Testament criticism. In another section of the book that we didn't discuss as much, Vreda points out that this messianic secret motif is not found in the redaction profiles of Matthew and Luke. So this isn't a term Vreda uses because this is a term that is developed in response to Vreda, but he looks at the fact that Matthew and Luke, when they add stuff to Mark, when they are inventing new stories, generally don't include this sort of secrecy, that where they they have secrecy, they're usually taking it over from mark and often they actually erase it or botch it (laughs) yeah right exactly mark in one place matthew introduces crowds where mark where where he also preserves mark's commandment to secrecy so there's this hilarious instance where the the crowds are present for jesus telling someone to not tell anyone that he's been healed um yeah that's in matthew 8 right after the end of the sermon on the mount if you guys want to look that one up at home see mark goodacre's editorial fatigue that that too yeah we'll we'll have to do a show about that for sure yeah um yeah so and again like if mark has the secrecy motif that no one else has this you know this invites another look like what what, why does mark only have this are there elements of mark's christology and mark's eschatology and mark's theology that are unique to mark that we only get by comparing mark in the way he deals with material uh in contrast with other gospel authors and that's something that we can really thank Rita for for bringing along and showing and showing scholars all right well that's all for today yeah that was fun i love Rita. so yeah all right thank you guys so much for listening and uh we'll be back with another book Please stop here. thanks to mitch and luke and all the guys from carnegie for letting us use their song coming home in the intro and outro music of the podcast you should check them out brighter stars than you i don't know